Hi everyone, um, welcome. Hope you're all doing well today. Um, I recognize most folks in the room currently, um, and I know there'll be a couple of folks joining us in a bit, which is great. Um, but if you don't know me, my name is Ann Magella, and I'm the Startup Visa Program Coordinator at the Innovation Cluster. Um, and today we have the great privilege to be joined by uh, Craig Elias, as well as Brandy Old, and um, super excited to have them join us today. Um, Craig is actually going to be doing a pitch workshop for us next week with our um, startup visa clients. Uh, but about a week and a half ago, Craig had reached out to me um, with this idea of test running a session specifically for um, experts and mentors um, talking about whether or not their idea will, will fly. And I thought that idea flew. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, we're this is the first time they're test running this workshop. So we're really excited to have folks uh, join us and to be the first uh, group of experts and mentors receiving this workshop. So thank you so much, Craig and Brady, for joining us and doing this workshop for us. Um, the session will be recorded and I can share that with folks um, after. And so I think I'll pass the floor over to Craig now. But yes, thanks so much for joining us, everybody. Perfect. So let me do this. So it's funny because when we talk about premiere, I think about my wife plays French horn for the orchestra in Calgary. And there's always these bragging rights about, oh, this premiered in New York and this premiere. So this, this is premiering in Peterborough, Ontario, <laughs> who, which I haven't been to since I used to live actually on the south side of Lake Simcoe, Jackson's Point. Mm -hmm. And I used to have an account in Peterborough back then called General Electric. Do they still make locomotives here? Is that long gone? Yeah, no, yeah, I don't think they make locomotives here. Long gone. So I'm going to treat this session like I treat every session, which is the first thing I try to get people to do is to connect. So what I'm going to ask everybody to do is go to LinkedIn, go take your full LinkedIn profile, including your HTTPS, and put it in the chat and find somebody maybe you're not already connected to and uh, connect with him on LinkedIn. Some of you might recognize uh, Ben, who when I'm looking at my screen, he's actually in the middle. He's the guy with the books all behind him. He's in the studio that I would normally uh, be working out of. So this is the space that we have. And what you see in the background actually is books from a bunch of the authors that we interview on a regular basis. So we run a program, a free program called Founder Fridays where the first Friday of every month, we find a really cool author, we buy 100 copies of their book. I generally read one, sometimes it's somebody else. We then do an interview of the author based upon the best parts of the book. And then at the 45 minute mark, we share a link where anybody in Canada can give us their mailing address and we'll send a free copy of the book across. Ben, maybe you can do me a favor. Can you just throw the link to Founder Fridays in the chat? Uh, and then I'm super stoked because October, we haven't got confirmation, we have a pseudo confirmation now, but the lady who wrote Blue Ocean Strategies, Renee Malborn, that book has sold 4 million copies. She's got a new book called Beyond Disruption and hers is the book and she's the author that we're gonna interview in October. So with that, what I'm gonna do is, hopefully he's got their chat, I'm gonna move to the slides. So everybody can see this. Um, I'm just gonna go over here. I'm gonna find this presentation. It's on one side, there we go. So Brandy, do you wanna introduce yourself? Sure thing, thanks Craig. Uh, hi folks, my name is Brandy and I'm joining in from Lethbridge, Alberta. Um, it's down on the south side. Um, I've been doing work with Craig and this kind of stuff for the last six-ish years, Craig. Uh, and really yeah. our whole goal is to start helping early stage aspiring entrepreneurs. Uh, I started working at the University of Lethbridge, helping students get going. And Craig was the one crazy kid that worked at Bow Valley that did the same thing as me that I could reach out to and be like, I have no idea what I'm doing. Uh, let's talk and figure out how we can make a cool ecosystem and support our students. So uh, I do tons of design thinking work and have a master's in social impact to look at how we can help businesses do better and help people. And my name is Craig Elias, and as Brandy said, I am the entrepreneur in residence at Bow Valley College. And my thing, like Brandy, has for the longest time, how do we find a way to help more people become first-time entrepreneurs? 
and we've done lots of stuff together. We wrote a, uh, a mentor guidebook so people knew how to mentor students. And this is an extension of that guidebook. The goal here is how do we create all these first time mentors? So what are we going to talk about today? We'll talk about three things, three big things. We'll talk about how do we help entrepreneurs avoid the big, biggest mistakes that they tend to make. We'll talk about how do you help an entrepreneur identify and test their riskiest assumptions, and then also helping an entrepreneur recognize when they need to just stop for a minute, go do something totally different, and we'll talk about pivoting in a second, or whether they should move full steam ahead. So I'm not sure if everybody's familiar with the term pivots, but a pivot is generally if idea A doesn't work, how do you go do idea B? And one of the first times Brandon and I did something around a pivot, Brandy said, how do you help someone understand what a pivot is? And I did some really quick research and I found this guy, Roald, who, if I remember correctly, and he had this expedition planned for the North Pole. He had this big, massive ship and all these supplies and all these people. And two weeks before he's taking off, he gets notified that somebody else has got to the North Pole before him. So he decides to pivot. Maybe just put in the chat, he decides to pivot. Where do you think he decides to go once he knows, or maybe just unmute yourself, where does he decide to go knowing that the North Pole has been taken? Anybody want to guess? Mark, you want to guess where he would have gone? Nope. Oh, guess. Where do you think he might have gone? I have no idea. What, what are you, you're laughing. You know the answer already. What's your first name? Nani. Nani. Where do you think he went? I don't Sure. What's the opposite of the North Pole? South Pole. He went to the South Pole. He was the first person to ever get to the South Pole. So that's what pivoting really is all about. So some of the mistakes that uh, entrepreneurs make, and Brandon and I have been fortunate enough, we spent time with David Bland a few times. Uh, I just recorded something special with him. And then we'll also touch on some work done by a person named Ash Maria. But helping un entrepreneurs understand the mistakes they make. One of the biggest mistakes that entrepreneurs make is- Sorry, they... uh, Craig, I, I wanted to get the details on that book. Would you mind backing up just for yeah, a second? Thank you. So this is one of my favorite books. Page 38, we'll talk about where's your risk assumption. Page 52, and we'll show you these pages, we'll talk Got about it. different types of data, and then pages 98 and 99 show you all the experiments. So we've taken the best pages out of the book with David's permission, right, and put them in here. But yeah, it is, uh, it's my favorite book, and Brandy knows really well, probably better than anybody else I know, just which experiment should I be running based upon what I already know? So, uh, but here's the mistake that entrepreneurs make. You know, what they do is they spend time going, oh, I've got something I can make, and they spend all this time making something. While they shouldn't be making anything until they really know whether people actually want what it is that they have. And even once they've figured out that people want it, they've got to figure out can they make enough money actually doing this before they decide to go away and make it? So that's one of, one of the biggest mistakes. And Brandy's gonna to touch on the next mistake, and this comes from some of the stuff we've done with Running Lean. So Brandy, I'll let you take it from here, and I will try and use the clicker and make sure I'm in sync with you. How's that? <laughs> Sounds good. So this is another uh, one of our books, Testing Business Ideas, I like to uh, say is my business Bible. I have three copies, no matter where I go, I have it with me. It is awesome. Uh, and this book that Ash wrote, he talks about how to start your business by starting to look at that desirability lens and helping entrepreneurs get out of that technician mindset. I'll let you hit next there, Craig. So what we learned from Ash is he built this thing called a lean canvas. If you've seen it before, it's very similar to the business model canvas, the tool to help entrepreneurs get their business idea out in one page. The challenge I like to give founders is to fill this out in 20 minutes. Uh, I think if they can't get their idea out in 20 minutes, they have a lot of work to still think about doing. Um, and the biggest thing that we see when they make an assumption about their idea, it's because they start with their solution. Let you hit next. So entrepreneurs fall in love with their solution. I'm sure you've heard this before. Someone comes to you, they're super excited about their idea, and then you spend the next two hours listening to them tell you how they're going to change the world and become a billionaire. Uh, and the thing is, is they don't do their testing right. 
So what Ash talks about and what he did in the Lean Canvas is he tries to teach entrepreneurs to fall in love with their problem. And that's the biggest piece of where we have an assumption that we have to test with entrepreneurs and help them avoid that mistake of falling in love with their solution and standing on a cliff shouting how amazing their idea is without understanding the problem they solve. And they have to tie it to their customers. They don't understand who their customers are and they don't connect the problem to the people that they're helping. Their business won't get started. So that desirability lens is really important when we look at how to get those tests out and get our entrepreneurs thinking about what to do. I'll let you hit next, Craig. What Craig and I really like to do, and as we did work with the Lean Canvas, we started to notice that some of our founders really struggled with getting that 20 minute mark and understanding the full Lean Canvas. So Ash has this thing where he pulls all of the insides out and all he has is something called a leaner canvas where you just focus on the problem and the customers. So when you're starting these conversations with entrepreneurs, you can pull all of the rest of the meat out and get them to just look at what's the problem you solve? What are the alternatives that there are out there? Who are those customer segments? And then how do we get to those early adopters? And we'll walk you through some of those processes of how to look at those specific components of where we would break out the leaner canvas to get these entrepreneurs started. Can I just Sorry, add something? Could I ask you a question? Uh, Go ahead, Mark. I, I, I just want to clarify whether whether you're actually looking for feedback on the presentation or whether the, the goal here is to do the presentation for our benefit. So we'll do the presentation and get feedback at the end if we can, just so we can run through it. But that okay. lot is also know how long it takes. But something I want to add here is that um, what Ash finds, and I'm sure you found, and what Brandy and I find, is that if someone fills out the entire lean canvas like a business plan, they're married to their work they've already done. They have this whole sunk cost mentality. And when we limit them to doing just the things that are on the outsides, they tend to be more open to taking feedback from mentors. So with that, Brandy, I'll let you go on. Sorry. Oh, no, no worries. So uh, I'm a big problem girl. We need to figure out how we solve problems. So this is where I spend 90% of my time with my entrepreneurs and we help them try to identify the top three problems they think their customers have. And the biggest thing that we see entrepreneurs do is that they can't articulate the problem properly. And they often look at talking about getting people into something. If you buy my thing, we'll get you going. But that's not how people buy. That's not what the motivators are. People spend money to get out of stuff problems. So when you're helping entrepreneurs list out their problems, you can use some words to help them kind of figure out where that problem lies. So we look at how do we avoid, reduce, minimize, mitigate, or eliminate something, not about improving or maximizing or benefiting. Those things come second to removing a problem. And Ash really helps us kind of figure out what those pieces are. Okay, right, let's just hit next. So um, this is another really awesome book uh, that helps early stage startups get going. It's designed to help student entrepreneurs. Um, it's called Founded by Melissa Kaufman and Mike Rabb. And they have a section in this book where they talk about the different types of problems that people have when they're motivated. And there's six of them. And these are ways that you can help evaluate a problem for your entrepreneurs. So first of all, is this problem popular? So do enough people have this problem? The next is, is it urgent? So how quickly do people need to get this problem solved? If it takes way too long to get there, they're not going to care about it. And then the next one is growing. So this is your market size. If the problem's going to go away over time, it's not worth solving. So I think we saw that with COVID with a lot of businesses. We've seen WeWork and Zoom even struggle uh, because this problem wasn't necessarily a growing problem. It had a reducing market. The next type of problem is it's expensive. The biggest thing here is you evaluate it from two ways. Expense can come in time and money, and it's best if it's costing people both. The fifth type of problem is it's mandatory. People don't really care about those optional problems that they want to solve, but they don't really get to. And then lastly, we need to look at frequency. So if it only happens once a year, people aren't going to care about it as much. But if it's something that bothers them every hour, they're going to be more apt to working on it quicker. So these are really great evaluative tools. To help people go back and really get to this, I learned something from a firm called IDEO. So they're a design thinking firm. And when entrepreneurs are disconnected from that problem and they're still finding that solution focus piece, I tell them to get into the shoes of their customers 
by practicing empathy. Uh, this is a really powerful tool to help them understand some of their assumptions. So one of the mistakes that entrepreneurs make that I coach, and I'm sure you've seen this too, is they put assumptions about what they think. So sometimes I just had a founder spend three months working on a website and their pre-revenue. Their product is food. They don't need a really good website, but they had an assumption that if their website wasn't big and beautiful, people wouldn't buy from them. So when I told her to put herself in the shoes of her customers to think about the problem she solves for moms who have too busy of a life to build lunches for their kids, I asked her, do you think they care about a website? And she went, no. And so helping them get out of that mindset to pull away from some of those expectations they have on themselves is very powerful. Uh, next, please, Greg. Another tool that I use for entrepreneurs is called a day in the life. So this is a great way to help them identify where those problems might lie for a customer if they're stuck. So we draw a T-graph that looks just like this. And on the upper half, they're going to look for trying to figure out positive emotions that people have. And on the bottom half, they're going to look for those negative emotions. And we put some words up there to help you kind of figure out what that looks like. And so the job of the entrepreneur is to look at what someone goes through in their day, in their experience around whatever problem they're trying to solve, and try to hit on those negatives, solve those problems, and look at where some of those benefits are. So I've created an example for you to see. Um, let's pretend like we're just, this is my morning. So what I've done is I've mapped out all of the things that happen in my morning that can be good or bad. So I'm sleeping. That's usually pretty nice. We don't get enough sleep. And then my alarm goes off. That's no bueno. Nobody likes an alarm. When I get up, I have a three-year-old Aussie Shepherd and we snuggle for 10 minutes every morning. It's great. I love it. I'm very happy. Then I have to pick my clothes. That's a pain point for me. I hate figuring out what I need to wear in the day. I got to look at the weather, blah, 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 blah. And then I take my dog for a walk. It's great to get outside. Then I look at my emails and my calendar and I'm like, oh my God, I have a lot of work to do. So that doesn't feel very good. But then I have a coffee and I feel like a human. So I'm doing better. I drive to work, sit in traffic, not the best. And then when I get to work, I realize I left my phone at home. So that's a really bad experience. So you can kind of have that mapped and then you draw some lines between and you can see where the biggest problems lie. And you want your entrepreneurs to focus on the ones that have the biggest gap between the positive and the negative and the one that sits on the lowest part of the negative emotions, those are going to help them figure out the type of problem that most people are worried about. I'm going to jump in just for a second, Brandy. I had a dream last night, and I have these dreams on a regular basis. I don't know about you, but I have these dreams where I've left my phone at home, or it got stolen or broken or something. It's amazing how much stress there is around just our phones. If we leave our house without our wallet, we don't go back. But if we leave the house without our phone, guess what? We're driving back to the house. Mm-hmm. So Craig and I and uh, another colleague named Wendy have been working on a problem validation interview script for the last four years that we've been perfecting. So entrepreneurs will sit inside their house and try to build something and figure this out. And they're too afraid to go talk to people. And we know that surveys suck. So we built an 11 kind of question interview that is a template for entrepreneurs to look through. So we always need them to try to figure out what that problem is. And then they need to try to go interview people. And we usually try to say interview at least 30 to get your head start. Obviously, the more you do, the better. And we start by asking trigger questions. So this is something Craig will talk a little bit more about. But we want to learn from our potential customers, when did this problem start happening? And then we go into the second question, which is looking at what they're trying to achieve. So these all tie back to the lean canvas, and these are all ways for entrepreneurs to test their assumptions. Often entrepreneurs think they know the answers to these questions, and when they go and talk to people, they learn that they were wrong. When we look at alternatives, this is something in the leaner canvas. So we ask, like, what are you looking at? What are you currently looking for to solve your problem so that they can understand what the competition is? When you look at what the competition is, the entrepreneurs can ask directly, what did you choose? and learning a little bit more about why they chose it. After you look at competition, we go into the value proposition, right? So why did you choose the solution? Understanding the behaviors behind the buying so that we can dig into figuring out what that problem is. Then we look at pricing. So these are all standard questions I'm sure that you've seen, that you've looked at, that you've helped entrepreneurs solve. And often they sit in their rooms and try to just map it out on a business plan and they don't validate it. So it's one of the other biggest mistakes that our founders make. Then this is something that we added, and Craig learned this from, Craig, who'd you learn this from? Olivia, Olivia Wong. Wong. Yes. Yeah. So this is 
a fantastic question. And honestly, I think this is probably the most powerful one in this interview where you're asking about the dissatisfaction. So on a scale of one to 10, how happy are you with your alternative and your current solution? And Olivia says, if it's more than a seven, they're not going to switch. So the switching costs and the changes, if someone's at a seven out of 10, they're not going to take the time to learn your solution and change over. So it's really awesome for that to help entrepreneurs know if people have a big enough problem. Yeah, the real competition is good enough. Whatever I have is good enough. And then we help them try to figure out who their ideal client is. And we have things called bifurcation questions, which I'll run over in a little bit to show you how this works. But it's a question where there's one of two answers to help them figure out their customer segments. And then the very last question is how to find more people like you. So often people don't know where to go and don't understand where people hang out to do their advertising or to ask more of these problem interviews. And this is a great way to source that, to learn about where people hang out and where you can do some good advertising once you get to that point. So So the next piece is around alternatives. And this is one of the mistakes that entrepreneurs make. And I have heard on many occasions, way too many occasions, where entrepreneurs say we have no competition. And I'm like, you always have competition. And and I will draw a little bit from Renee Malborn, who we're gonna hear from in October, is that it doesn't matter what you're selling, there's always different ways to solve a problem. The example I like to use is that if we all owned a jewelry store in Peterborough, what's the main retail street in Peterborough? Um, I guess like, George. So George Street. So let's pretend we all own a jewelry store on the sunny side of George Street and we're all doing $5 million in business. What do we compete against? Each other, right? But you don't. You compete against all the other ways that somebody might say to somebody they love, I'm sorry, or I love you. And if you wanted to do that, but you aren't spending money on diamonds, what are you going to spend money on? Anything. Clothes. <laughs> I'm thinking flowers, chocolate, right? Uh, cars, pets, shoes, purses, or trips. And it's my 10 year anniversary and I've been saving up for a while. And I was like, what am I gonna do? Where am I gonna take my wife? So I decided to take my wife to this place in the bottom right hand corner called San Sebastian, Spain. There are more Michelin rated restaurants in San Sebastian, Spain than anywhere else on the planet except for Tokyo. So like any really good husband, what did I do? I found the best hotel right on the beach with an amazing view. And what did I make for dinner for our anniversary? You wanna guess what I made for dinner for our anniversary? I took her to a Michelin star restaurant. I took her to a Michelin So what we did, we went to a one-star Michelin restaurant. I made reservations for dinner. We had dinner at a one-star Michelin restaurant. And before we left, we had dinner at a three-star Michelin-rated restaurant that's the number three restaurant on the planet. So when you say you don't have competition, the entrepreneurs always have competition. So what I have been teaching for a while is this um, alternative or competition matrix where they put themselves on the left, they put their direct competitors who do things just like them on the next column, and the next column over is what is the most commonly used alternative? because that's the largest portion of the marketplace. And then the one on the far right is the most expensive alternative, because that's, again, where people are likely to be dissatisfied. Um, So one of the, if you don't want to read a 255 page book, this is a nine page Harvard Business Review article that really helped me understand this whole concept of competitors and competition. When Southwest Airlines, which WestJet is modeled after, when Southwest Airlines comes out, it doesn't view other airlines as its competition. What it views as competition is all the other ways to get between Dallas, Austin, and Houston. So cars, trains, bikes, motorcycles, buses. And when you have an understanding of what your competition is, just like Southwest could do, they could take a billboard halfway between Austin and Dallas that says, if you've flown Southwest, you would be there already. So this is one of the mistakes that entrepreneurs make. We have no competition. There is always competition. It's just a different way that people solve this problem. 
One of the things, if you want to go investigate the, this a little bit further, it's called the jobs to be done. JTBD is another way to be able to understand what are all the other ways the job gets done. Brandy, do you want to add anything here before we move into the customer segment? Uh, if you look into the jobs to be done, I'll put a link in. There's a really great case study about milkshakes uh, that was done that really set the stage for jobs to be done. That's a great way to illustrate to entrepreneurs. So I'll, I'll, I'll find that for you guys. And then I think our jobs to be done speaker is December, Ben. Is that correct? Want to just nod your head? Yes. That's, there we go. So the one of the founders of the jobs to be done framework is going to be our founder Friday speaker in December. So with that said, Brandy, do you want to spend some time on the mistakes that entrepreneurs make around customers? You got it. So the other piece on the flip side, everyone says I don't have competition. And then you ask them, who's your customer? And they say everyone. Uh, and that is impossible to do as a startup. That is one of the biggest mistakes we see. So our job is to help them figure out who those people are. And there's this great book called Crossing the Chasm that helps entrepreneurs figure out where you start and how to get into that bigger market eventually as you go. I'll let you hit next there, Craig. So when we're looking at helping people identify, there are four main customer types, and this comes out of there. And there are kind of the values that your customers have. And when you're starting your business, you want to be looking for people that have this red value system that are action oriented. These are your early adopters, and these are some of the qualities you would see. Next, you move into these yellow nurturing people. So these are the type of people that are really relationship built, and they look at building community, and they're more open to having that relationship to have that feedback component. And that would be something that you guys are doing with us today. Then we move into the green types. So these are the people that are into knowledge. So the more that you have for data and validation, they're easier to sell to. And your last group, the harder people to sell to, are your blue. So these are your blueprinting people that are very systematically focused on processes. Lots of entrepreneurs try to start with the blue because they think that they're the biggest market and they're the hardest to get to and that they can be different, but it never works. So here's how Craig has kind of worked on mapping this out and figuring out how we start with those early people to get to that ideal customer. So there's two types of entrepreneurs that you'll see. There's your B2B and your B2C. So selling to businesses and selling to customers. And when we're looking at selling to your business, you want to be looking for people to sell to that have money, authority, and influence. And you want to try to find the person at the top that has the most money, authority, and influence that you can sell to. And if you can't sell to that person, you move down the line to get to the next person that maybe just has some money and authority. And in this example, it could be either your like CFO or a controller. There's usually different types of people that have this. And depending on where they go, we can look at how they kind of flow up through the process in your business. And if you can't get to those, you move down the pipeline and keep getting to the easier people to get to that work at smaller businesses that maybe still have some authority, but aren't at the bigger business side. And so when we're helping entrepreneurs look at how to sell, it isn't always about just getting to that first person in the door at the business. It's about finding those people with money, authority, and influence and trying to find the other people underneath if you can't get there and going to smaller businesses. When we look at our B2C groups, this is where we kind of talk about this bifurcation question that I talked about in the validation script. So people always start with the full market. Well, how do I sell my widget, my whatever to everyone? You don't, you need to find that niche market, those early adopters to start. So we start by trying to get through these bifurcations. So there's this great example, Craig coached this group and I love it because it's so Canadian. They were trying to solve a problem to help people deal with the smell of hockey bags. So when their kids go to hockey, they smell really bad and they had a solution for that. So once they understand what problem they're solving, they could look at that market and say, well, we sell to anyone that plays hockey, but that's not what you want to do. We ask a bifurcation question to help them figure out where to split the market. So when we work on this, it's looking at, okay, well, who's going to be the most impacted by this? And I'll ask you guys, do you think it's mom or dad? Um, yeah, mom, totally. Totally. Right? Moms are the ones that do the cleaning. They care the most. So now that we know we're looking at moms, we ask a second bifurcation question to figure out where we focus. 
So now we're going to look at the age of kids that play hockey. So do you guys think that it's people that are under the age of 12 or kids that are over the age of 13 that have this problem of a smelly hockey bag more? Probably both, but the older kids are going to be more. Totally, right? Puberty, hormones, it's gross. So we have our moms that have kids that are over 13 and we need to do one more layer. And so we're going to try to ask how many days do they play hockey? Is it more than three days a week or less than three days a week that have this problem? What do you think? I don't know. I, I, I think if you like a clean hockey bag, <laughs> you're going to buy a pocket. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> so when we look at the problem of the smell, if you're playing hockey more than three times a week, your gear doesn't get to dry out. It stinks even worse. So that problem is even worse. And those are the people you look for. So you're looking for moms who have kids that are over 13 that play hockey more than three times a week. That's the niche market. And then we had in that interview question, where do you find people like this? And that's like a tough one. So when you're helping these entrepreneurs, like dads are the ones that take them to practice all the time. The moms are the ones that clean up. So it's like, how do you get to these moms? And Craig was sharing this in a session and someone went oh i'm a hockey mom i go to all of the tournaments and so just even by socializing and talking through this we had a solution come up for these entrepreneurs to be like okay you can go find more moms at tournaments to sell your problem and learn from them so this is a great tool to help your entrepreneurs figure out who that niche is and where to start to find those reds and those yellows and the term i've heard is the the, the narrower your focus the fatter your wallet Mm -hmm. So I want to spend a little time on uh, early adopters and the way that I think about the whole early adopters comes back to something that Brandy brought up in our questioning that we came up with the problem validation interview, which is around people that recently had something happen to them that makes them think what they have is no longer sufficient. And I'm laughing to myself today specifically today, in fact, I might be laughing at my wife at the same time, because there is, a, there is a time when couples get dogs. And when do couples get dogs? Well, they get couples, they get dogs when they get together, but they also get a dog when their kids move out of the house. So my son is literally two weeks away from moving to Saskatchewan, and this morning, what did my mom, my mom, what did his mom, my wife found, found two Border Collies up for adoption. I'm like, talk about so yeah this is this is what i've learned and i uh first learned of it this way actually from david bland and i've done a bunch of stuff with david and he also gives some credit to a guy named justin wilcox who i don't know but brandy knows relatively well around this whole early adopter portion of the marketplace so i took what david did and i turned it into a slide like this and these innovators and early adopters they have a problem they know they have a problem and they're actively seeking a solution to the problem. And the mistake that way too many entrepreneurs make is, as Brandy talked about, they go after the majority, the early or late majority of the market, thinking that's what's the largest portion. But the hard part is that part of the market is not actively seeking a solution yet. And sometimes, even though they have a problem, they're not actually doing anything about it, right? So, uh, when we're looking for early adopters, even in this ideal client profile, we're not after everybody, even though we have a problem they can address. And even though, as Brandy talked about, we now know how to reach them, they're not going to change until they're motivated. And this is what I figured out. I was a sales guy for almost 20 years. And one day, my luck as a salesperson stopped because the company I was working for admitted to conducting 11 billion, that's with a B, it was a company called WorldCom, $11 billion in accounting fraud. And all of a sudden, nobody would buy from me. And I couldn't figure this out. So I took some time off to reflect on all my six, seven, and eight figure deals. And what I figured out is there is this sequence of events that gets people to become a customer in the business to business world. And we'll talk about the business to consumer world in a minute. So what I realized is a lot of the time when I'm selling or when an entrepreneur is trying to sell something, the people they're trying to sell to are happy with what they have and they see no reason to change until one day something happens. And that makes those people want to change. And when they want to change, I call this a window of dissatisfaction. So these are people 
that are unhappy with what they have, but they're so busy solving other problems, they haven't gotten to this problem yet. But this is one of the most important parts of the sales process because this is when someone decides what the problem is. They define the problem. And when they define the problem, they start the process of designing a solution. And what happens is just like when we buy a brand new car and we see that car all over the road, the same thing happens to these decision makers and buyers is they've got a problem. Now, all of a sudden, they start seeing all this advertising or Facebook, any of that stuff that's now in front of them, and they start deciding which way are they going to solve the problem. They're not choosing the vendor yet. They're deciding, am I going to, for my 10 year anniversary, buy my wife a diamond ring, a car, or take her on a trip? Then they have their second event where now all of a sudden they can afford to buy. So now they either have more money or more time. This is when they start the process now of what is called searching for alternatives. They've already decided what they're going to buy. Now they're going to decide who they're going to buy it from. And this is the difference between inbound and outbound. And depending upon what stage the entrepreneur is at, it's amazing how they just go, people will come to me. The data says that if you wait for someone to come to you through some sort of inbound marketing, the average close ratio is about 17%. If you get to people sooner back here, and if you're proactive about this, the average close ratio is five times higher because you were there to start building a relationship while you were helping them redefine the problem and start designing the solution. But just because somebody wants to change and can afford to change doesn't mean they're going to change. They can't change until they can justify the purchase to somebody else. And one of my favorite stories to tell is when the iPhone first came out. Uh, and I have one of the original iPhones. And when I first saw it, I found it on eBay. It's $660 US. They'll ship it to Canada. I found some software that will break into it so I can make it work on uh, Canadian network because I was a Rogers customer. I still am. No, Rogers, Fido. Uh, it's on GSM. So I find this phone. I want this phone. I can afford this phone. They'll ship it to Canada. They've got it in stock. I only have one small problem. My problem is my wife is Scottish and we don't throw anything away. So my wife said to me, that's nice, dear, but what are you going to do with your old phone? And I couldn't buy it. And it was about three months later, my son, who was two and a half years old at the time, he found my wife's really nice Motorola flip phone, and guess what he did? He broke it in half without any guidance from his dad. So now what I could do is go to my wife and say, here, dear, you can have my really nice Sony Ericsson phone. I'm going to go buy the iPhone. And now, because I can justify it, I can actually make the purchase. This is the way that it works in business to business sales. In the business to consumer world, about seven years after I figured this out, McKinsey came out, did a bunch of research, talked to 20,000 people in a bunch of different industries and in three different continents, and they figured out almost the exact same thing. What happens is people have this loyalty loop. They do the same thing, they do the same thing, they keep doing the same thing over and over again until all of a sudden something happens and it creates interest in doing something different. And when they have that event, that trigger, they then create this thing called an initial consideration set. What is the way I'm going to solve that problem? And then what the McKinsey research says, that people will, once they've got a consideration set, they'll start this active evaluation, and then it's not until they get to the end where they have another trigger where they can justify it and they decide. My perspective is that most people, even when they're consumers, depending upon the income they have and the cost or price of what they're about to buy, they still very often need to have a different trigger where they can afford to buy something, an inheritance, a promotion, the neighbors to the left of me. It was uh, about three years ago, and all of a sudden I saw a brand new $70,000 Volvo SUV in front of their driveway. And I'm like, hmm, 
I think I know what happened because Tracy was a stay-at-home mom and her youngest daughter was now going to grade one, full-time school. What did she do? She went back to work. And as soon as she went back to work, she could now, or they could now, afford a nicer car. What? So based upon this, we're now gonna have a whole bunch of assumptions. And we, need, we now need to find a way to validate these assumptions that we've got. So when we work with these entrepreneurs, we need to help them document assumptions they have around how well do people want this? What's their belief? We believe that everybody is our customer, or we believe that moms who have teenagers that play hockey three times a week or more are our customer. So we need to help them understand what are the three assumptions they have about how, why, or when somebody would have interest in their product or service. Then once we finish with the desirability piece, we need to make sure that they can make enough money at it. So what assumptions do they have around how much people will, say, will pay? How often will they buy? How long will they stay a customer? And only when they've done that, do they then now start spending time validating the assumptions they have around the fact that they can actually make it. And what you do is on page 32, sorry, 38. Brandon, you want to double check? I'm pretty sure it is page 38. The 38, you will see this really cool tool that David created. And I heard people for years tell me, test your risk assumption, test your riskiest assumption. And it drove me crazy because I'm like, what the f is my riskiest assumption? And it wasn't until I came across David's two by two matrix that I had an understanding of what my riskiest assumptions are. So what you do is you take your assumptions, so in this case, there's our ability assumptions, and you map them based upon how important they are and how much data do you have or how much evidence do you have to validate that assumption. And you map your desirability assumptions, you map your viability assumptions, and you map your feasibility assumptions. And then what you need to do is you need to figure out what's the farthest to the right and near the top. This is your riskiest assumption. You need to go away, you need to test that assumption that you have. And when you're done with your risk assumption, you then test your next riskiest assumption. And when you've finished with the things that are on the top right-hand quadrant, then it's really important to go back to all the stuff that's in the top left quadrant. You need to go back and just re-look at that data because way too often, one of the mistakes that entrepreneurs make is they don't see data that invalidates their assumption. There are these things called counterfactuals. They're blind to the stuff that's staring right in front of them but they go, no, that's not the case. And every piece of data they see, they think validates their assumption instead of invalidates their assumption. So now that you've got to go test your assumptions, you need to make sure you get the right data. Brandy, do you want to take it from here and talk about good evidence and bad evidence? Sure. So when entrepreneurs get to this stage, they'll look at anything and everything and take it in as evidence. So if they talk to someone random on the street about their idea and they go, that sounds like a really great idea. They're going to come back and be like, perfect. Someone likes my idea. We're good. I love to use the example of if you were to start a gym and you were to go out and do some interviews or talk to people, you could ask everyone like, how many of you would like to start to go to the gym three times a week? And even in this room. I mean, you'd be like, yeah, I would like to do that. That sounds like a good thing. I should do it. No. <laughs> Mark, you're like, no. <laughs> <laughs> I love your honesty. <laughs> so an entrepreneur might be like, you know what, Mark? I'm not even going to hear that. I don't care. Uh, I heard that almost everyone in the room wants to do that. And then you open a gym. And let's say you opened your gym in January. This is just after New Year's, right? Everyone has those New Year's resolutions. January 27th is considered the official day of quitting. So they've done research and people can usually stick to their resolutions for 27 days and then they quit. So if you opened a gym January 1st, you might have some evidence that shows, hey, my business is doing really well for the first 27 days. And then after that, you probably have to close your business. 
And most people won't show up to your gym because even though they want to be the type of person that goes to the gym three times a week, they're not. So there's types of evidence that entrepreneurs can collect that helps them really weed that out by avoiding some of those common pitfalls that they see. So this is a great thing from David's book where he talks about weak to strong evidence. So rather than trying to get opinions from people, you want to look at facts. So this is past behaviors. So rather than asking, would you like to go to the gym three times a week? Or do you think you'd like to be that person? You ask, do you go to the gym three times a week already? Looking at past behaviors and getting facts of what's actually happened. You can look at what people say versus do. There's something called the say do gap that's very big. And this is where I want to be the person that does it, but I don't. Uh, and then we can look at lab settings. So this is like if you've got science folks or if you're testing in your garage, none of it matters. If you're in a controlled space, rather than in the real world, it doesn't matter. So you can have the best technology in the world, but once it gets in the hands of users and they can't use it, it's moot. Uh, and then looking at small versus large investments. So entrepreneurs sometimes will say, well, I had 400 people sign up for my newsletter. So that means that I'm gonna make a ton of sales. So when they go to look at their assumptions and their viability, they're going to say that they have 400 potential customers. Signing up for a newsletter is not the same as putting your money where your mouth is, and entrepreneurs often miss that. Can I just jump in here so because when, I think it's, it's really important. This man is talking about the say-do gap, and there's two things I think that are super important here. Making sure that, so again, you're not allowed to interview, you have to, sorry, not allowed to survey, you have to interview people. You can't just talk to everybody. You need to figure out who is in your target customers. When you go to talk to total strangers, the first question is, hey, Mark, have you ever had this problem? They say yes then you go to the next part. But it's always about, and Brandy touched on this, is making sure we're asking questions about the past, not about the future, so that we know the evidence is stronger instead of being on the weak side. Sorry, Brandy. No, no, you're good. And so when you're using this as a tool to help them map on their assumptions, you can look at this and say, okay, did you get a survey? That's a weak evidence. So that helps you figure out where on that assumptions map the information goes. And it really keeps your entrepreneurs honest about how they collect their data. So when you're looking at this type of evidence, there are experiments that David has listed out and created. And this is why testing business ideas is my business Bible. This is on page 98 and 99. I can almost draw these out in my sleep. I use it all the time. These are the pathways that entrepreneurs can follow to test their assumptions based on some processes and their industry and type of business. So this is page 99, and it shows you the different types of companies and the journey that you can take entrepreneurs through with the types of experiments they should be running to validate their ideas. Different experiments test different things. So you start with desirability, then you look at viability and feasibility. So these are all looking at those layers of going through how those work. And in the book, they give you a full layout of how much time it's going to cost, what it looks like, how to run the experiment. It's a fabulous layout for entrepreneurs to look at how to go through this stuff and keep working through it. Now, once they're done, Craig talked a little bit about confirmation bias. So I always try to figure out how do I keep my entrepreneurs honest? So after you help them map their assumption, pick an experiment to run through, then you create something called a test card. So you can download these for free. They're PDFs. Um, I've created a different version of this that has a little bit more info. Um, and you go through it with your entrepreneurs. So you figure out when they're gonna run the experiment, when it's due, and they have to write that assumption down. Then they have to write down their experiment, what they're going to do to measure it, so how they're gonna quantify it, and how they know they're right. To me, that bottom box is the most important thing because what entrepreneurs will do is they'll go away, they'll do 30 interviews, and they'll have 28 interviews where people will say, I'm satisfied of eight out of 10, but there's two people that said a two out of 10 and they'll go back and they'll say, oh, I'm still right. Two people in my interview told me that they weren't happy, so I should go ahead. And that's because they really are in love with their solution. So when you have that piece of knowing when they're right, this keeps them honest. So when they go back, they have to go, oh, I didn't actually reach it. I wanted to have eight out of 10 people dissatisfied and I only had two. That means I need to go back and either pivot or pause on my idea to figure out what to do. So a great way to capture this when it's done, 
this is another card that they've created is the learning card. So this is helping them review what they did in their experiment by reviewing their test card and looking at what they tested, what their assumption was, what they got for their evidence and what they learned from it and then what they'll be doing. So it keeps them going through that flow through of the experiment process. What's really good with this is when entrepreneurs go to pitch their ideas, they talk to investors and they're talking to programs like incubators, maybe to get in for their applications. We always want to know what did you do to validate and entrepreneurs often go, well, I just know. If you've ever had that, I just know who my customer is because I've been in the game for so long. You know, yeah, I know great. My idea I sold for 20 years. I know. Yeah. yeah. And we go, well, how do you know? And they go, well, I just have experience. And that's not enough. So these cards are so helpful because there's so much going on in the entrepreneur experience that they don't remember this stuff. And it's one page, super simple. And then they can have a little deck of these are all of the validations that I learned and how I did it. And it keeps like it really clean for them. I like that you've got it assigned to like it's it's uh, if you have a team, it's very likely that different mm -hmm. people are going to get different responses. They rarely get the same responses. So if more people do the research, it's better. Well, and, and here's the thing I think, well, yep. here, here's my perception. So when you say that, I, I kind of disagree, but let me tell you how I disagree. The, the way I disagree is the entrepreneur is going to get the same data, but he's going to interpret it differently than someone who's not one of the founders. This is one of the reasons why when we do this on a weekend and we send these first time entrepreneurs out, they do it as a group and different people take turns doing the actual questions and other people take notes. So yeah, they have multiple people and there's that confirmation bias kind of gets tempered, but unfortunately still in many ways exists. So Brandon, they've done all this. What do they need to do now? So this is where they need to figure out what to do. This is the three P's. This is D-Day. So we talk about pause, pivot, or persist. So based on their learnings, what they've seen, do they need to pause? Have they learned that their idea is not desirable and not viable? If that's true, they should take a minute and try to figure out what they're going to do. It's not recommended to move forward. The second option they have is they can pivot. So maybe it's one or the other. Maybe people were desiring it, but it wasn't viable or it was viable, but the desirability was off. Um, so we have some examples here. So maybe the customer acquisition cost is too high, or maybe the lifetime value of your customers isn't quite there and your market is going to get too small. So this is a really great way for the entrepreneurs to look long term. Craig. And then for those people that are mentors, when we talk about pivoting, usually it means one of two things. It either means solve a different problem for the same customer or solve the same problem for a different customer. So right now the assumption is this problem and this customer, but that's not enough. They need to pivot. They need to change one of those two to then go do a whole bunch more testing to see what actually works. And if it turns out changing the customer doesn't matter, then they go back and say, maybe I'll keep the old customer, but change the problem. You keep doing this until you get to the point where you get to the next step, Brandy which is persisting. So once you've continued those experiments, if you've had to pivot, or you've validated that you have your desirability and your viability, you have your complete lean canvas, you can start to move into testing your feasibility by building a minimal viable product or your first prototype. So really it is not until this stage that entrepreneurs should start building. And that is one of the biggest things and the biggest challenges I have had as a mentor and a coach is helping the entrepreneurs understand that they're not in build mode yet. They waste too much time, money, and energy. And you don't have a lot of that when you're a startup. So helping them understand that from that lens is the whole point of why we run through these pieces. Well, and this is the way that I think about this. And I learned this from a really cool lady at Babson College in Wellesley, Massachusetts, just outside of Boston. And the way she helped me understand this or the way that I bastardized what she taught me is you spend $50 before you spend $500. You spend $500 before you spend $5,000. You spend $5,000 before you spend $50,000. And with that said, we have some time for questions. I'm just going to uh, stop my screen sharing and then I can see comments. So let me just stop sharing and then I can look at the chat. I'm curious who has questions. I know Mark has some feedback that he's ready to give at some point, but I'm curious if Dan or Nigel or Laura or Mario, uh, and then I'm trying to read my computer's too far away. 
Um, Safilka, how do I pronounce your name properly? My apologies. Sophia. Sophia, right? Does anybody have questions they want to ask? Nothing right no. now that I can think of. Okay, um, Mark, you had some feedback you wanted to give earlier. Do you want to share that? Uh, well, I, here's two things. I just I thought of. I'll, I'll start with a really good one. I, I really like that uh, uh, you focused on the problem. One of the biggest things uh, I see is that uh, people they do a lot of reading and, and they use the word idea instead of problem. And so when they focus on their idea, they're focusing on a solution, and that isn't the way. And so uh, uh, a suggestion that I would have on that is actually to take a little bit longer on the idea because to, to drill it in for people that it's such a critical idea, you need to take longer to understand the problems and, and use the plural, it's problems. It's gotta be multiple. Uh, that way, when you go to pivot, you know what you might be pivoting to. Um, so I really like that about, uh, about the presentation. The, uh, uh, I'll disagree on the uh, 20 minutes to the lean canvas. Uh, you know, the, the lead canvas, I think, is their, it's their whole business strategy. So I, I don't think any point should be given for, uh, for getting to be doing it in 20 minutes. I, I think you might even take 20 minutes for one box, you know, or longer. You talk about your, your business model, you know, deciding on your business model, you might take an hour or a week, you know. Uh, so I, I, I don't know why you would try to do that in 20 minutes. I have some okay. others, but yeah, I, I appreciate other that, people Mark. speak. Mm -hmm. It's good feedback. Okay. Um, Nigel, you got your hand up. Yeah, I just uh, thought I'd just a little bit of feedback. I mean, I, I love the presentation. Um, you know, working with startups, I see a lot of startups who kind of live in that bubble, you know, and I think one of the things that I would push out there is that there's a, a fear to get the no answer when I come up with an idea when I talk to yeah, customers. I'm so, so afraid I to get love, no, it's a good point. Okay. I yeah. love the idea of kind of getting um, those forms filled out and and going out and talking to you know 20 30 40 different people um you know I, I always try to get people to go out there and and validate all the various steps within the within the within the boxes right it's uh to me it's you know you come up with your value prop and you sit there with your team you come with the value prop and then is it done or do you have to go out and check it with somebody to make sure that it actually resonates with anybody so i, I love that idea um, and I love the idea of the, the, the questions you're putting forward. Um, the only thing I would say is to, when you talk to entrepreneurs, make sure they don't ask the question like the gym question, um, make sure that they're doing the drill down for that to, uh, to get the answers. Uh, I hear so many entrepreneurs come back with the, uh, with the happy ears, you know, they've, uh, they heard what they want to hear. Um, so having it written down and making sure that they drive and drill down a bit is really, really cool. But uh, I love the idea of what you've done there. It's uh, nice. Cool. So, Brandy, as we think about this, I think what uh, Nigel's saying there are what are called second order questions, using silence so they tell you more, um, yeah. paraphrasing what they just said. Like Nigel just said, really nice. If I was a salesperson, I would go, really nice? Yeah. Exactly. And I would wait for him to tell me more. So that's nice. So somewhere in here, we don't know if it's in this or somewhere else, but just that whole idea of questioning skills, super important. Um, who wrote the book? Never split the difference. Chris Voss. Um, I haven't had a chance to bring him in yet as one of our Founder Friday speakers, but maybe now is the time. Cool. Anybody else got questions or feedback that want to share? Dan. Um, I think that the, the mention of the well, actually, I'll just let me back up a bit. I'm currently in kind of just getting into mentor mode, but I'm also in startup mode, so I'm living both sides of this. Um, I think the, you know, the, on top of the idea thing, it's interesting because being somebody, I have a background in, in, or at least part of my career is coding and development. So I've had all those, you know, you get those friends that come to you and they're like, I have an idea. It's going to be a million dollars. And, you know, and it's, I feel bad sometimes with how quickly I squash things with a quick Google search. But that's the point is like being humble enough in your ideas to do the competitive research and competitive analysis to know who's out there, what's out there. People get so stuck on their idea that they, they're not willing to even go and, and find out who's doing something similar, whether it's, you know, direct, you know, maybe it's a different cost structure, whatever it is. But I mean, at least doing that research. Um, 
you know, it's concerning sometimes. I'm like, really? Like, you know, it's only about five minutes. Like, you didn't do that? You, you want to go make a million bucks? And I mean, they're coming to someone like me saying, you, you know, you, I, I just, you just need to build it for me. It's like, <laughs> type of thing. So, you know, it's good to, to push people into some of those things too, doing that competitive analysis and everything. Brandy calls it GTS. Brandy, what's GTS? Yeah, I tell my entrepreneurs this all the time. Google that shit. Yeah. <laughs> There's a site called Let Me Google That For You. I don't know if you've ever seen that. And it's a very sarcastic way to tell somebody, can you just go look that up on Google? And it's the acronym. Yes. Right? Okay. Yeah. I love that. What is it? Say, say and it, that you again, type guys. in a Google search and then you send the person the resulting link. And what it does is have an arrow come up on the screen and type and it types something in on Google and click search for them. Let me Google that for you. It's a That's very, fabulous. very, very passive aggressive way of telling somebody just go look it up. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's nothing more that kills an entrepreneur when you're sitting and applying for funding with an investor and they can pull up a competitor that you don't know in your pitch competition. I've seen it happen. It's very embarrassing. So yeah. that's, that's good. Cool. Ladies, gentlemen, appreciate this very much. Uh, this is recorded. I, will you share the recording with the group, do you think? Yeah. I can okay. share the recording. Cool. And then Brandy and I will suck it down. And I texted Brandy a few ideas based upon um, what we heard, this whole idea of solving the problem. There's an Einstein quote that says, if I had 60 minutes to solve a problem, I'd spend 55 minutes understanding the problem. Um, when we talked about experiments and Brandy said, hey, it shows about this, that, and something else, I'm like, maybe we can put an example of one of those actually mm -hmm. is that's in there. And then just this whole idea of, yeah, if someone only has 20 minutes, maybe if we just get them do the leaner canvas, the four things on the outside, instead of the whole thing in 20 minutes. And that just helps us document where they think things could be uh, better done instead of focusing on all the other stuff that's inside there. So I wanna say thank you, Brandy, totally appreciate this. Um, yeah. Brandy and I, Brandy, do you wanna put your, did your, is your LinkedIn profile already in the chat? Sure is. Okay, I'm gonna put mine in. I forget what mine is, but I cheat because I own my own domain name and if you just go there, it will redirect you straight to my LinkedIn profile. I always forget what it is. All right. Yeah, cool. Stay so connected, said, you guys. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Stay healthy, everybody. Have a great week. See you. You too. Thanks. All right. Thanks, everyone. continued working opportunities um, for the residents throughout potentially okay. um, that kind of thing so cool so yes let me just I'm gonna get out of here can I end this meeting yes yeah okay I'm just gonna go like this <laughs>